I want to show you how to do impossible DMEC. Let me show you an eye that I operated on yesterday, which is one of the most difficult cases that I've done this year. Let me tell you about this patient. This is his only other, his only eye. He's got a prosthesis in the other eye, and this eye has a long-standing failed PK, which as you can see is opaque and densely vascularized. And what options do you have to fix this? I mean, another PK, that's definitely not going to work. He's going to reject that immediately from how densely vascularized this transplant is. You could do a keratoprosthesis, that's true, but you hate to do that operation if you don't have to in somebody where they've just got one eye and maybe follow up is a concern or adherence to a medical regimen. If you could do something that would rehabilitate the eye without imposing more post-operative obligations, that might be a better solution. So if DMEC were possible, then Perhaps it would give this patient functional walking around, live your life vision without imposing a lifelong litany of additional obligations. But how would you do something like that? Because this is an opaque cornea. And when I saw this patient on the operating room table yesterday, my heart sank a little bit because you think, well, is this operation really possible, okay? And I'm going to walk you through how we do this surgery, how DMEC can be done, and what the relevant considerations are for operating with an eye like this. First thing is you can't see anything into the eye. And normally what I tell people is that if you're going to scrape the cornea, wait until the last possible second to do because it transiently improves your visibility a lot, but then you lose back what you've gained. But here, I can't see anything. So we start the operation by scraping the cornea to see whether I can see anything into the eye, whether it's even going to be possible to attempt this surgery. And that doesn't help much, but the next thing I do is I place a chandelier illuminator. Chandelier illumination from DMEC was a concept described by a Japanese ophthalmologist, Takahiko Hayashi. And look what happens when you plug the chandelier into the eye. You turn the light on, you turn the microscope light off, and boom, immediately you can actually see into this eye. And when I saw this yesterday, I got so excited because I thought, hey, Maybe this operation is possible. So then I proceed to start making some paracentesis to gain access inside the eye. Now this is a small eye, it's got a small diameter prior PK, so I'm making these incisions big, way out beyond the limbus. And I want big wounds so I don't have any trouble coming in and out of them. I put an anterior chamber maintainer in, and this is a cyclodialysis spatula, and I'm just sort of interrogating what's going on inside the eye. And I'm noticing two things. Number one, the chamber is deep. That's great. I was afraid that everything, the lens, the iris, was all smashed up against the back of the cornea, but the fact that I have room to maneuver this cyclodialysis spatula, that's incredible. That's good news. So I'll make a couple of extra pairs and TCs and I'll go around bluntly dissecting around to figure out what's going on with this iris tissue. It's in shreds. It's this tattered, irregular, wadded up mess. And you can't leave that. There's no way you can unfold the DMET graft in the presence of all of that crap. So now I'm using a 25 gauge vitrectomy handpiece to vitrectomize all of this stray random iris tissue up in the anterior chamber along with this uh, synechia and fibrotic membranes that are present there. And you'll notice as I remove more of that iris, your visibility improves into the eye. So now I'm gaining further confidence that this operation may be possible. I make a main wound. This is a 2.4 millimeter keratome, which is slightly smaller than I normally prefer to use. Um, this operation I'm doing at the local eye hospital. I go there once a month and do cases that have to be done under general anesthesia. This is one of those cases, so I get better control. Here I'm about to inject the graft into the eye. It comes in this glass cannula and we're delivering it through the wound. We're injecting it in and you'll notice as the graft goes into the eye, you can see perfectly what's going on with the graft. And this is a scary image, 
But it's also a beautiful image. It's beautiful to look down at the eye and the graft here. And this, from this point on in the video, everything is unedited. I'm going to walk you through exactly the way that we unfold this graft. Now you can see when I turn the microscope light back on, everything washes out. You lose your view. So this operation must be done with the microscope light off with the chandelier on. What I'm doing now is I'm trying to inject fluid at the graft to deepen the chamber and tumble the graft over. Because when the graft is flipping, tumbling in a deep chamber, often you can catch sight of the edges of the curl. The graft will curl into a more favorable configuration. So that's always the first thing I do. Eject the graft and then I deepen the chamber, let the graft perk up and see what I'm working with. Now you'll notice here, that's not working. The graft looks like it's smeared between the back of the cornea and the front part of the patient's uh, implant lens. They have an IOL, which is poorly visualized here, but the graft is caught in between those two surfaces. And I'm injecting fluid, but inappropriately, I'm directing that fluid at the graft. I shouldn't be doing that. I'm getting a little too excited. But the problem is, is when you inject fluid at the graft, in a cramped confines anterior chamber, it pushes the graft over into the angle, which is what's happening right now. So I didn't deepen the chamber. All I succeeded in doing was wedging the graft into the angle. And typically, you cannot bump the graft out just by taps on the surface of the cornea. So I'm going in through that paracentesis, and I'm directly engaging the graft with the tip of the cannula, and I'm poking it out of the angle. Okay, that's what I'm doing there. And that took me a long time to learn. When you have an angle-trapped graft, what you should be doing is trying to deepen the chamber and you should be poking the graft out with the cannula rather than trying to bump it out with taps on the corneal surface. And here you can see I still have this vaguely origami folded graft. I have a cramped confines AC, but right there, as I just tumbled the graft, I can see this edge kind of curling up towards me. And that is an important indicator that the graft is right side up. That was a lucky, fortuitous occurrence where I can tell the graft is right side up. I am an amateur chess player. I'm not any really any professional level of good, but I, I remember reading this biography of this world famous Russian chess grandmaster, Mikhail Botvinnik, and he said what makes a great grandmaster is not playing every move better than your opponent. It's the insight to understand what a critical moment in the game occurs. When something critical happens to recognize this is critical. And the reason I mention that is right now, this is the critical moment. I know that the graft is right side up, okay? And this is the critical moment to do something. The graft is right side up. The Part of the graft away from me is cramped. It's smashed between the back of the cornea and the front part of the iris. But I know here that the graft is right side up. And if we can unfold this, we win. So what I'm doing is I'm putting the anterior chamber maintainer back into the eye at a low rate of fluid inflow. This is about 15 cc's per minute. So it's just a little bit more than a dribble because I don't want to uncontrolledly expand the anterior chamber. I just want to deepen things up a little bit because if I can deepen the chamber, then I can get that edge of the graft to come out. And another thing that I probably could have done yesterday to make my life easier would have been to do a pars plana vitrectomy. If I had vitrectomized that eye, that would have released the tension between the front of the eye well and the back of the cornea, and that would have allowed the graft to unfold. You know, people think that DMEC is more difficult than eyes that have been vitrectomized or eyes with a hyper deep chamber with an AC IOL. It's not. Those are much easier cases. The more difficult cases are cases like this, where there's just no room between the back of the cornea and the front part of the iris, so you can't unfold the graft. And what I'm trying to do now is I'm reaching in with coaxial forceps to grab the graft and pull it over here towards me. If I can pull that folded edge more into the center of the anterior chamber, that's where it's the deepest. So I'm pulling the graft over here and I'm placing these taps 
on the surface of the cornea to try to iron that edge of the graft out. And I'm facilitated by this anterior chamber pumping fluid into the eye, which deepens the chamber and gives me a little bit more room to move that edge of the graft over. And look, we've had some success. The graft is definitely better unfolded than it was, but there still is this lingering inferior edge that remains flipped over the top. Now the graft has been pulled maximally to this side already. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in from the other side using the same 25 gauge coaxial forceps and I'm going to grab the edge of the graft and I'm going to pull it over this way. And as I do that, I'm going to place taps on the surface of the cornea. Now, finagling these coaxial forceps through a paracentesis, even though these are 25 gauge, it's sometimes difficult to get them to wiggle in into the eye. That's why I like you to make large paracenteses because they're much easier to get in and out of under difficult circumstances. So here the graft, it looks like it's pretty well centered. It's 70% unfolded there's just this last lingering inferior edge fold that if we could iron out, the operation would be done. And now I'm trying to decide how to go about doing that. And I'm evaluating my options. Could I go in through a paracentesis? Could I use the main wound? What I worry about is that if I use the main wound, which is what I always like doing, I've got an anterior chamber maintainer running. I'm worried about flushing the graft out through the main wound if I'm using it to try to poke the graft edges open. So I have that in the back of my mind, trying not to screw the operation up here at the end. The problem is, is that the paracentesis are so much more fiddly than using the main wound. You sometimes get ore locking. It's difficult to get in and out of the paracentesis because I've got the microscope light off, so I'm not exactly sure where they are. So at this point, my primary concern is not to mess up the success that I feel like I've already achieved. So I'm holding the graft here, again with those coaxial forceps, and I'm trying to get that edge to flip over with taps on the corneal surface, and that's not working. So it looks like I'm going to have to do something different. And the thing that's going to be required is, again, direct manipulation with the cannula. So here I am through a paracentesis, and I'm trying to get underneath that edge and just push it out like this, just to push that edge away from me. And you'll notice that that is remarkably successful. And what contributes to the success in this case is that I do not have a tightly scrolled graft. When I'm doing difficult cases like this, I always request DMEC tissue from a donor 70 years old or older. Because if you use tissue from a 60 year old or a 50 year old or a 40 year old, it can be tightly curled. And if you have a tightly curled graft, it just makes it more difficult to unfold. But you'll notice here, the elastic tendency of the graft is not so great. It wants to open up. And so just with a few little encouraging motions with the cannula, I can completely unfold the graft on top of the patient's IOL. And there it is completely unfolded in the eye. I still have the anterior chamber maintainer going at this point. So what I'm gonna try to do is lift the graft now by putting an air bubble underneath it. The AC maintainer is still on at this point, okay? So here I am trying to lift the graft with an air bubble, and you'll notice the entire chamber doesn't inflate. In fact, I'm only successful putting this little bubble in the eye. And I think, okay, well, it's time to remove the anterior chamber maintainer. That's what I'm doing. You'll notice the eye kind of twitching as I'm pulling this thing out. And I think, okay, well, that should make it a little bit easier for me um, because now I don't have fluid competing with me to put air in the eye. So I'm going to try to go back through a paracentesis. But look, everything shallows up. You'll notice the bubble expands and the eye sort of shifts inside. So we've still got an eye that wants to be a problem, even at this late stage of the operation. So I'm trying to think, how can I inflate the anterior chamber without screwing up the operation again here at this late stage? So I'm thinking here on the operating room table. And what I decide to do is rather than inject from that paracentesis to move my angle of attack up to where the anterior chamber maintainer was, which is in closest vicinity 
to that bubble. Okay, I'm going to move up to where the bubble is and I'm going to inject basically directly into that bubble to expand the bubble and inflate the anterior chamber. So that's what I'm doing here. Okay, so I'm going to turn the microscope light off so I can see what I'm doing. And then I'm just injecting directly into the bubble and that inflates the anterior chamber and pressurizes the eye. And that's the end of the operation. So this was a scary but fun operation that we did yesterday. And I have not seen the patient for even his first post-operative visit. But I was excited to make this video um, for a few reasons. Um, the first is, is that yesterday, seeing the patient on the operating room table, I, I really genuinely didn't know if the surgery was going to be possible. I mean, the visibility into the eye was basically zero. And I thought, well, if you just can't see what you're doing, then it's just impossible to do the surgery. Um, but the key thing that enabled that operation to be possible was Dr. Takahiko Hayashi's chandelier illumination trick. I mean, without that, the operation couldn't be done. And so if you have some situation in which your visibility is poor, you may try that because, I mean, it was the key to us being able to do that operation. Um, the other thing that was important to understand about that surgery was that the thing that made it so difficult was the shallow anterior chamber. That was the hard thing. Once the visibility problem was fixed, I mean, and the light fixed it immediately, the hard thing was keeping a deep chamber. And the anterior chamber maintainer was critical to facilitate that operation. And it would have been even easier and better if I had thought to do a pars plane of vitrectomy just to remove a little volume from behind the lens. Now, how this patient is going to do, I don't know. Hopefully, they will do well, and we'll be glad to have done this. Um, but I think it was certainly worth a try in light of the alternatives. You know, the alternatives are much more ingrace, in, in, invasive, aggressive operations that commit you to a lifelong of, of uh, regimen of doing things. If we can bring back reasonable vision without any of those commitments, it's a, it's a reasonable thing to try first. But the most important reason why I make this video is if you can do DMAC in an eye like this, then almost all of your everyday complicated cases you should be really encouraged about. An eye with bullous keratopathy with a tube shut or an unstable IOL or an eye with a prior PK. If this is possible, those eyes are possible. And some of the little tips and tricks that make this operation doable, you might find very successful in your other cases where you feel like, yes, this is a good candidate. How do we do this operation? These tips may help you with those cases that you may see more often. So I was excited to share this video with you. I hope you get something from it. Thank you so much for watching. And if you're doing DMEC and you want to do more or more complicated cases, reach out to us. We have observerships. We'd love to have you come. If you're a resident watching this video, we have fellowships. We'd love you to come to do a fellowship with us. Spend a year doing these complicated cases. It's some of the most fun, rewarding things that we do. And we'd love to share it with as many people as possible. Thanks so much for watching.